But today um, I was going to talk a little bit on assessments uh, and what uh, assessments we run through at Nexus Performance um, because on the weekend, uh, not just past, but the one before that, um, I presented for uh, Rebel Performance on the online uh, performance summit uh, on a general talk of longevity, uh, durability, um, and, and basically long-term success in powerlifting. Um, and that covered uh, a little bit of individual assessments, a bunch on movement, a bunch on uh, kind of smart periodization, getting the most out of your programming long-term, allowing you to keep progressing over time, all that stuff. Uh, and considering it was a 60-ish minute cap on that, uh, it did mean that um, that I was unable to really dive into kind of methods. It was more of a principle, more of an overview of the subject. Uh, and it meant that, um, it, well, yeah, it was, it was quite hard to give specific information. Uh, and I got a bunch of questions after it, a bunch of messages after it talking about uh, asking for those methods, for, for like how we assess, how I assess, um, how I progress people through some of those models that I, I presented on as in like, you know, after we assess people, um, we want to give them the competency to move and that we want to build skill and transference to the main lift through those uh, ranges. So it was a, yeah, so a fair bit to cover in that 60 minutes and hence we had to kind of somewhat breeze over it. But today um, I'll talk through at Nexus Performance what we do for assessments in a rough guideline um, and we can go from there. Thanks Gerard. Shout out Gerard again. Just getting a shout out every, every, every level we do. Dried number one customer. Love it. <laughs> For the life. <laughs> Although he is a bodybuilder. We don't like that in our lives. Anyway, assessments, our process, Nexus Performance's process. Um, so when we get somebody signing up to it, whether they're a powerlifter, whether they're a, a strong man, whether they're a bodybuilder, whether they're a gem pop person who wants to get strong, who wants to get big, who wants to get healthy, um, whatever the uh, whatever the goal, whatever um, the ultimate goal we want to get into, we usually just put them through a general movement assessment first. Uh, so they sign up, they go through our system, that everything is good um, before we write the program, before we uh, kind of get started on things. Um, we give a general assessment. That general assessment for us, um, it's done through video, so they film it like. I filmed them all myself and then they look at those videos they film themselves on the same things back um, and we and we look for for uh, movement uh, within that so we use mainly mainly there are a bunch of other ones as like I'm, I pulled the page up now we've got like maybe 15 or whatever but um, uh, video different kind of assessments that we do use but the main ones I'll use and I'll start at because uh, it's kind of like a tree like we start we could do the main ones from those main movements, I can usually tell a lot about how a person moves, uh, where the tendencies lie is in like how they're going to move, um, what ranges they're going to have missing, what what things they need to work on. Uh, and then from there, I'm going to uh, either be happy with that and prescribe things from that, um, or I'm going to dive further into that um, and look at more specific tests, look at more specific ranges that I can test um, and that I can used to kind of like uh, confirm what my thinking is, confirm what um, what I think is what's going on. Because sometimes, sometimes, uh, sometimes people can present with funky stuff and they've just been working around it for so long. They've been, they've been um, working on fixing one thing for so long that they've developed um, competency, uh, competencies. They've developed um, issues in other areas that have kind of been laid on top of that and it just becomes a little bit of a mess. So sometimes when I think somebody's gonna be missing whatever range it is, internal rotation of the hip, whatever, all of a sudden it's like, oh, wow, you have that on the one side. Oh, wow, the two sides are different. It, it gets confusing and then all of a sudden throws way more spenders in the work and it uh, makes the process just not quite so simple. But like I said, I start at the big ones, I start at the big picture stuff. Uh, and the big picture stuff for us is going to be a toe touch and a global extension, as in literally feet together, toes straight, knees locked, bend over, touch your toes as best you can. Uh, 
in whatever way you do it. I'm not gonna tell you exactly how to do it because I'm looking to see how you move. I'm not looking to see how well you can follow my instruction to move the way I say. Um, and then I'm going to get you to bend backwards whilst doing the same thing. Knees together, uh, toes, uh, feet together, toes straight ahead, bending back as far as you can. This tells us a bunch of things. It's not just telling us, oh, you know, how's, how's your hamstrings? Uh, flexibility or whatever it's it's not that it's it's seeing how you uh first of all how you move the ribs how you can press here on the front and spend the back to touch your toes where that where that uh rounding in your back is coming from um where you get your ranges from how the hips forward and back in space the sacrum um has that ability to do that as well uh, when we go backwards we're looking for you can you lift up through here can you create nice even extension? Can you create any extension? Um, just generally how you move in that as well. Does it cause pain? Does it cause discomfort? Those two tests can tell us quite a lot if you know what you're looking for and it can be an indicator for if they're gonna be lacking IR, ER, um, at the hip, all this other stuff as well. So it's it's not that they're testing one, one thing. I like to use those tests as like big global tests to tell us where they're getting movement from um, and assessing a bunch of different things. Uh, if anybody has any questions on this, by the way, before I move on. Uh, please post them up. And I'll post a little thing that's people. New people know what we're talking about when they come in. Um, so, yeah, toe touch with global extension tells me a hell of a lot. Tells me a hell of a lot what's going on with the ribs. Tells me a hell of a lot what's going on with the spine in general. Uh, tells me a bit what's going on with the hips as well. Um, and from then there are, there are drills which you can use to assign uh, and, and to hopefully improve them. And we can use those also as a retest after to see if those drills are actually working. Um, I use just testing an infrasternal angle. So testing to see whether they're wide, narrow, um, at the infrasternal angle, that tells us a lot about their general tendencies throughout their body. Um, what I'm looking for in that, uh, again, it's going to tell me, give me an idea, give me a, um, give me an idea of what's going to be limited at the shoulder here, and through flexion, extension, internal, external rotation at the hip, same thing. It's going to give me an idea of what's happening. And then if I'm happy with between the toe touch global extension, the infrasternal angle test, um, and just a general squat test, from those, I'm going to pretty much most of the time be able to draw a picture of what's happening. Through all those, I can go like, hey, I think that I'm pretty sure they're going to be missing those ranges and just how they move gives me a good idea of that. And through most people, I can use just the, just those are, are, are handle enough um, along with looking at their technique in the squat bench deadlift under heavy loads, assuming they're powerlifters. Um, through, yeah, so through those, I can, I can pretty much, I don't need to go and measure every single joint range individually. Um, it really, they paint a good enough picture for how that person's kind of ranges are going to be. If I feel like I need to dive in deeper, then I can, you know, get them on a table or, you know, being online at Nexus Performance, get somebody else that I trust in, a city, in the city to measure uh, their joint ranges in particular. Um, and, and, uh, and it's going to pretty much clear up what I'm going to do with them. So recap infrasternal angle, toe touch, global extension, and like I just said there, the squat, just the body weight squat, literally getting them, hey, front of the camera, squat from the front to full depth, however you wanna do it. I don't care how you wanna do it. I'm not asking you to brace up like it's a max weight, spread the floor, all this type of stuff. Just squat how you wanna squat, squat how you wanna move. Best you can from the side, squat, and from the back, squat full depth all the way to the floor as deep as you can go under control assuming it doesn't hurt um, and it's, it's actually quite funny how how many top level elite strong people struggle uh, when they don't have a bar on their back they're like oh fuck you know no the bars on my back I just don't know what to do I don't know how to move um, and so it although this these people can usually obviously squat they know how to squat um, just that body weight squat will start to show me how they're moving in space uh, generally and how what their brain, the process is, how they're gonna go through things. It's also pretty easy to see, especially in that back view, um, 
hip shifts happening from the side view, uh, whether they can can control that pelvis through the sagittal plane through through uh, flexion extension of the hip. Um, and if that's not enough, if if I think that they're lacking some of that control, or maybe they're just being a bit lazy, I can give them other things like a standing march where we're up against the wall, we're reaching, touching the wall, and then we're just going to simply do this with less loose clothing, preferably. Uh, and I can see how their, their hip control is on each side and um, something simple as that can, it can tell a bunch of story about that, um, that hip control. So like I said, it's, we're starting at those top tier ones, the, the ISA, the toe touch and extension uh, and the squat body weight, as well as lift technique videos under the recent heavy lifts that they have, squat bench deadlift, which you mean they're a powerlifter. Uh, and through that, I'm going to filter down and go like, you know, I, th I think this is the limitations that they have. I think this is the, the tendencies that they have. Um, and I'm starting to already draw up a picture of how everything's moving, how, how they're aligned uh, in my head. Um, and then from there, I'm going to assign like flow on test from that to kind of confirm my theories. I'm going to, um, yeah, I can, I can individual joint assessments or, or other bigger global assessments, like I just said, with that wall march and stuff like that. I, can, I would, if they're in person, measure uh, hip extension. It's just that measuring hip extension online, uh, so something we got taught at like Zach Couples course or, or, or Pat Davidson's course or, or through PRI and all that stuff is like a modified obis test. It's just really hard to do online effectively. Um, when you have somebody in person that knows what they're doing and the person that's being tested that knows what they're doing, it's still kind of like fiddly to get right, exactly. So to trust somebody who has no idea what the assessment is, has no idea what they're looking for in the assessment, um, and to trust one of their friends that is in the same boat to do the assessment, quite difficult online. So these global assessments give me a much better um, general picture of what's going on. Uh, from there, so that's looking for a little bit of passive range, a little bit of active range where they control joints, all that different stuff. From there, we're going to assign uh, general warm-ups or movement uh, prep activities to do before they lift. Um, and that is, uh, from, from there, and they, they're gonna be generally starting at the lower end of things, depending on how much pain they're in or, or if it's just kind of like a movement thing that's little, but it's not really cause, it's just causing a bit of tightness or something, something like that. So the, the severity of it is gonna, gonna change one day, but it usually start at the bottom. It's gonna be like, um, uh, like a supine 90, 90, sideline 90, 90, some sort of bear, bear drill like that. Um, to start with like getting a stack better, getting them to see if they can access that tuck better, see if they can get the ribs down better, um, all that stuff. And then some more specific drills. I did post up my, uh, my current movement prep on YouTube recently on the Nexus Performance YouTube. Uh, and then through that, through some of the stuff which I do. And the reason why uh, I did that is because I feel like people get stuck in movement prep being, I'm not gonna say easy, but just like a low level. Like they'll do a plank, or they'll do a side plank, they'll do a 90-90, all this stuff, which is fucking fantastic for a certain uh, field of people. But at some point you need to progress beyond that and start to load those positions if you want them to stick and if you want them to transfer to your bigger lift. So as you get better at that, as you know what um, you should be feeling in like a 90-90 drill or, or, or whatever the, the low level drill is, we're gonna progress that up. We might get you to do a reaching squat or a goblet squat, front squat, zercher squat, split squat, something isometrics within those um, where there is more load, there's more input to the system to kind of combat um, the noise that's being put there by the big lifts that you're constantly chucking at the body. So through those big lifts that you, um, this is kind of what I went through on that summit presentation, but those big lifts are gonna create you, put you in patterns to be strong. Um, they're gonna come with kind of self constraints. They're gonna build in constraints so that you're very stable lifting that big amount of load. Um, so you're gonna miss, uh, be missing ranges or you're gonna be missing control based on those. Uh, we can't be perfect at everything at once. Um, and then we're gonna use these, uh, these movement prep drills, these assessments, and then there's movement, specific movement prep drills to the individual to bring back that range, to bring back uh, the passive range and to bring back control over that range uh, and have it transfer into the lift. 
and bigger, stronger people will need a little bit more load, a little bit more stimulus, a little bit more stress to the system to, to create an adaption to, to uh, transfer into their big, bigger lifts in my experience. So if you'll, you'll see my movement prep in particular, um, the drills are fucking hard. Uh, it'll be like a reaching squat. And although that's an e easy version of a squat, a regressed version of a squat, we put it in a position where, um, where it makes it really difficult for me uh, the quarter halfway down, making it really difficult, holding that isometric for 30, 45 seconds, counting out long full breaths throughout it. Uh, if you think about it, that's just a 90, 90 drill flips, right? It's just loaded now. Um, there's a lot more going on, a lot more things to hold stable. Um, I do a low bed drill on that and I do literally a 90, 90 drill, pushing into the wall as hard as I can, pushing my feet into something to create kind of load resistance at either end and kind of squish myself um, further into those positions that I'm trying to achieve, get more, stimulus to the system to, uh, to change, um, to overcome those uh, big signals coming from the big lifts. So the bigger, stronger you are, the more, the, the more kind of loaded, the more resistance you're gonna have to add to these patterns to make them stick around. And uh, it generally makes sense. It's generally what people do anyway, whether they're thinking about it or not, um, as an experienced kind of coach. Um, and then we're going to build it into our programming as well in some manner. Uh, now, I won't go through it in full, but I talked about periodization, smart periodization throughout that, whereas close to a comp, you're really just gonna have to double down on, uh, on your main lifts, on your skill, on your neuro efficiency to carry over into your lifts. Things like, obviously, squatting, benching, and deadlifting. Um, adding pauses in there, adding tempos in there to, to build control uh, through those lifts. Everything's going to be either aimed at improving those lifts or keeping you healthy, keeping your knees from being too pissed off. Every 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 exercise in there is going to be ticking one of those boxes. It's going to be either transference to the main lift directly or stopping you from crashing and burning. In off season, we have a lot more play. Now we can uh, focus on hypertrophy. Now we can focus on stability, control, whatever you want to call it. Um, and now we can use regressed lifts, things like uh, front squats, split squats, uh, split RDLs, RDLs, um, bench variations, varying grip, varying uh, positions with the feet, uh, varying incline, varying all this different stuff to build yeah, we're gonna build strength in different ranges, in different muscles, in different muscle groups, in antagonist muscle groups, all this stuff, um, which is gonna carry over long term. Um, but when I'm picking those exercises, I'm also keeping in the back of my, my mind what movement uh, ranges they're missing and stuff like that. Uh, and I can still bias those exercises uh, to change the position of them to still open up ranges um, that we're missing while still getting a stimulus for hypertrophy or, or others as well. So uh, the, I guess the, the take away from that would be that, yeah, we do kind of lowish level movement prep work. Hi, Serbia, Marco. Uh, do these movement prep work at a, like, don't get me wrong, they're hard, but they're not like, the huge building muscle intent behind them, the intent's moving better for sure. But then as we get into the workout and as we do our movements and we do our accessories and stuff like that, we can still use these accessories to put ourselves in positions to drive movement options, to keep movement options open, to give us more movement options um, and still get a stimulus for hypertrophy within them. Um, so we can layer different intents in there when we have more play and more freedom during uh, a phase that's further from comp. As we get closer to comp, powerlifting is that type of sport where we have to do squat, bench, deadlift competition. Squat, bench, deadlift, we have to do that. Our whole sole focus is gonna be on that, whether it's making you feel good, whether it's making you feel like crap. If your goal is to lift maximum weight on the platform, we're gonna to have to do them. We have no choice, um, we have to get away from them. If you're playing nearly any other sport, okay, like maybe, maybe a little bit more freedom in those, but powerlifting is very specific and we have to do those and we have to get transference to those if, if anything's gonna happen, especially at a high level. Um, so I'm talking more off-seasoning for those accessories for that stuff. In off-season, you should be coming out of your workouts, out of your leg workouts, not feeling like your hip flex is on fire, not feeling like your lower back's just wrecked. You should be walking out of those sessions feeling maybe even a bit better than when you first came in. 
more tired, more fatigued, but you should be walking out going, hey, you know, like my hips feel good now, my, my shoulders feel good now, Every, you know. Um, and obviously this depends on a lot of things, but, uh, but the general rule should be that. It should be that you're walking out feeling better than when you came in. Um, during a prep, not always the case because you're pushing your body right to the top, right to the limit, to, to, to stress the body, to get an adaption, uh, to be one RM strong on the platform when you, where you need it. So uh, different areas. But to go right back to where we started, um, through our process, Nexus Performance, we're gonna use usually toe touch, global extension, a general body weight squat, front side back, um, infrasternal angle, as well as a lift technique from recent kind of heavy-ish lifts on squat bench deadlift, and draw up a plan for those to open. Passive ranges aren't there anymore, um, and we'll use those tests as a retest to see if that's working. So if somebody can't perform the toe touch well, and then they get half their way down, and they, you know they, they're not getting any flexion from where I want in their rib cage, um, or they're getting it all from one sport or something like that. We're going to do drills and then we're going to retest it and see if it's improved it so we know whether it's effective. Uh, and then we're going to progress those drills as they get better at them and, as, as, and keep things kind of adapting. So your, your warm-ups, sh- your movement prep drills should still progress. There should be progressions, regressions to your movement prep drills as well as your actual training if you want to get uh, the best results in full out of it. All right, so that was my little talk on that. Uh, I don't think I didn't post up yesterday exactly what I was going to be talking about and exactly what uh, to expect on this and things like that. When I do that, usually the questions come rolling in straight away. Obviously right now with uh, not as many people being aware of this going on, um, there are less questions and that's fine. But I'll keep talking, I'll keep talking about this different stuff until they keep rolling in. Oh, there we go, Mark, straight up. Coffee before I answer the questions. Do you have any shoulder mobility exercises, pre-heavy low bar to avoid a little bit of bicep, uh, elbow bicep pain? Tough one in powerlifting because it is, like I said, it's a sport where we have to do low bar. (laughs) Because my general advice would be, don't do low bar. Um, But, we're powerlifters, we have to, the goal is to lift the maximum weight, not for our elbow to feel good. Uh, so we uh, are going to need to do it and that's not an option to just wipe it off the floor. However, just from a, a programming point of view, just to kind of get around this question a little bit and, and encompass it fully, um, usually with those people, we'll change uh, the amount of volume they're putting through low bar, um, maybe supplement it with a bit of close but not as as hard on the shoulder elbows as much something like high bar or safety bar um and kind of spread that volume between them to get um the max still max carry over to the lift but hopefully just doing a little enough that we can we that it's not that big of a deal so if i can get around it like that that's usually just going to be uh the way ahead um on that front uh, so we're going to tack it from a few different directions so there's that uh, obviously looking at technique improvement, so whether they can hold wider and still create stability out there, whether they can drop a thumb, whether they can drop a pinky and, and get more rotation uh, that way um, is going to be the second prong of that approach. And like you said, the shoulder mobility exercises, pretty heavy low bar. Um, it's not that there's anything like hugely specific to it. Like sometimes stuff's like a simple, you know, you see people with the, the stick and just stretching and stuff like that. Sometimes that can that can be enough, but obviously it's not going to be a fix to the issue. It's just going to be a, a small Band-Aid um, to it. Uh, but like I said, those big global assessments, those, those if I can Im- uh, focus on improving those and focus on giving them range at the ribs, at the scaps, at the shoulders themselves, usually it just, it will take care of itself to a certain degree. It's, it's just that I've never been able to fully like conquer it for people that are, including myself, that are big, strong, and doing a lot of volume through low bar. It's just something that um, I'm not gonna say is just part of the game because I don't feel like that's a good answer and it's a good mindset to put to people. But once you get to a certain point, it's very hard um, uh, to get around it fully. Um, but man, if you message me, uh, and we can have a look at your movement 
individually, like you as an individual and have a look at it a bit deeper. I just, I feel, I feel like that would be a better way to address this because I can help you look at your ranges. Cause I don't think it's going to be one thing where it's just like, Oh, um, uh, like this is the answer. Like you're literally driving a really end range scap position, a really end range shoulder position, all this stuff really jamming stuff in. So it's a really uncomfortable, really crappy position for your shoulders to be in. You're putting a lot of volume, a lot of load through that. Yeah, this is gonna get pissed off eventually. That load's gonna be smashing that. So I mean, it's not, there's gonna be like a one thing, like I said, a limit load and whatever. But if you message me your, um, your particular uh, video of your squat. And then also um, uh, we might go through a couple little assessments and I might be able to help you out more individually because it's, it's really not a, a, an overall thing. Foot position on the bench press and what we're trying to achieve. Um, trying to achieve just total tension through the body um, it's not like your, your legs aren't lifting that weight. Your legs aren't pressing the bar off your chest. Uh, it's just that if we're creating total tension through the body as much as possible um, so that when we do lower the bar, touch the bar, pause, press the bar, that there's no tension um, kind of leaked, if you want to call it. There's no, there's no power being dispersed out it's all going into the bar so you, yeah your legs and your foot your feet position and stuff i wouldn't focus on like this is best that's best it's just where you can create the most tension uh, if your feet are more out in front like ipf style flat <clears throat> you're gonna be pushing away from you kind of in like a leg extension type motion getting a lot of quad uh, and pushing all your weight back onto your traps neck uh, and and loading up that area and trying to get your shoulders as stable as possible with your feet are still under you it's still kind of the same similar idea it's just that when your feet are under you it's going to uh, put your body in a slightly different position and my cue for that would be pushing the heels uh, towards the ground as hard as possible the other thing is with this that people when they think leg drive they think that they're trying to just get to the bottom and then use the leg try to kind of jolt it up and throw it off the chest it's not the way we want to do it we want to create as much tension from before you unrack, just before you unrack, as you unrack, holding that throughout your reps or rep or whatever you're doing and right until you have to react, uh, rep, rack it again. So it's not like a particular portion of the lift, it's just that leg drive is constant. Usually when I can't see it in my client's videos is when I'm like, oh, awesome, like this is what we want. When I can see like a little bit of a jolt happening through the body throughout the lifts, a little bit of movement, that's that's not what we want, um, even though that's what people think is leg drive. So as far as foot position, the bench press, I don't think it really matters as like this one's better, that one's worse. It's going to be what where can I create the most amount of tension and where can I hold consistent tension throughout the lift? Because like I said, your legs aren't lifting that weight, they're just creating tension through the body uh, so that uh, so that the, the muscles which are doing the pressing can do the thing which they're meant to do. Um, and that will be my answer on that. I, uh, I don't... Uh, I don't think that we need to worry about feet and leg drive any more than that. Just get it on, hold it on, uh, and keep it going throughout the lift. Try to not move, try to not have a uh, shifting through your hips and through your, through your belly and all that. Keep that chest high. All right, um, I'm gonna leave this one there. Um, because I don't want to sit here just rambling on different assessments. I've said what I need to say on assessments. I've said the assessments that, uh, the general broader assessments that we use mainly uh, and where they lead the thought process to down that line. Um, we've said that we're looking for the passive ranges that we need uh, to complete the lifts in the way that we need to. Uh, the best way uh, we're looking for uh, to build control through those ranges once we have it, like I said in that um in that summit uh, presentation. And then also keeping in mind that everyone's a little bit individual uh, and that people are going to need to access ranges slightly differently depending on technique and, and, and things like that. And it's, it's just a, it's a periodization. It's a thing that we need to look at in big picture. Um, so hopefully that clears up a couple of the questions that I got uh, from that summit presentation for people.
And if there is any more, feel free, send them through either as a DM or on Friday where I do a Q&A every week and uh, I'll answer it.